Moin and gluten dark. Are you a sourdough baker and you want to avoid a couple of common pitfalls? Well, then I got you covered in this video. By avoiding those pitfalls, you will get more oven spring, have bigger pockets of air instead of your crumb, get a nice looking ear on the top of your bread, have a crispier crust on top and a not too sour taste. And this to me is the perfect sourdough bread. It was so good, I wish I could give you a slice. If you want to improve your sourdough skills and master baking a bread like that every time, then I got you covered in this video. This video is part of a series. In this series, I'm looking at improvement areas for sourdough bakers. I'm looking at them chronologically in order when they happen during the sourdough process. Now, this video is the first video and it will focus on the very early stages in the sourdough process. And this brings you to number one, you have the wrong technique for your bread. I would say there's two categories. There's wheat-based bread and there's all the other breads. Now for wheat-based breads, you have to knead a lot. You have to develop those strengths. Whereas for the others, you pretty much just have to homogenize all the ingredients. Kneading is not required because there's no gluten where you could develop any sort of dough strength. One small exception is spelt flour. Modern spelt is very close to wheat, so there's also some kind of gluten development. But in general, I see people kneading a rye bread and then they wonder why it's so sticky. And yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Just stir everything together and you're pretty much done. But if you want that open, crumb, fluffy wheat bread, then you have to go through all the pain of kneading and much more. So yeah, know what you're making. Number two, choosing the wrong amount of water for your flour. On the interwebs, there's so many amazing recipes and they look so delicious. And then you're like, oh, wow, I want to bake this as well. And then it says 80% hydration. So 80 grams of water per 100 grams of flour. And then you just try to bake it and you notice, whew, it just simply doesn't work with my flour. Well, I had to learn this the hard way every flower is really unique. Just following a value blindly on the interwebs is not going to make you amazing bread. You have to figure this out for yourself. You have to test your flour to see how much water your flour can absorb. Typically, the higher the gluten amount, the higher the protein amount. Gluten is around 80% of the protein. The more water you can be using. And this is something you can easily test with your flour. I've made a video before where I showed what happens when you use different levels of water for your flour. I pretty much prepared five different tiny bowls and then just tested a different level of water for each bowl. And then I tested after an hour or so, after I let that sit, whether I can get the window pane effect on each of the bowls. When you notice that you can no longer get the window pane effect from one level of water, well, then that's too much. That's something you shouldn't do. And if you're a beginner, then you should even consider going a little bit lower in terms of water level, because that's going to make everything so much easier. The higher the water level, the more advanced your technique has to be. Number three, your sourdough starter isn't as active as it should be. I see many new bakers setting up the sourdough and then they're overly excited to start baking with it. Well, it's really awesome to bake sourdough bread, that's for sure. But wait a few more days until you really see that your sourdough starter is able to double in size at room temperature within eight hours. The time really depends on the temperature. So in this case, it's how I can't see. <laughs> The warmer it is, the faster the fermentation goes. Fermentation is really the key. And that's the process where the microorganisms of your sourdough are digesting the dough. And you wanna make sure that that happens at a healthy rate. And that's why you have to create a lot of microorganisms inside of your sourdough. If you don't, the whole process is way slower. And that's bad because over time, when you create a dough, your dough is also going to degrade. That's because enzymes inside of your flour are being activated by the water that you mix into your dough. So you're working a little bit against time. And that's why it's important that your sourdough starter is so active. If you aren't there yet, no worries. 
Just keep your sourdough at room time temperature for a couple of more days and feed it once per day. The second thing I see related to this is that people use their sourdough starter coming right out of the fridge. I use the fridge when I don't bake for a longer period of time because in the fridge, the fermentation process almost comes to a halt and you can just keep your sourdough inside of the fridge for a couple of months without having to feed it. But when I take it out, I notice that the whole fermentation process is so much slower. For me, it takes a couple of days with daily feedings until my sourdough starter is again on the same level as it was before. So when you wanna bake and your sourdough starter is inside of the fridge, make sure that you remove your sourdough roughly two days before you start baking. Then give your sourdough starter at least one feeding per day, ideally two feedings. That's going to make your sourdough so much more active and it's gonna be so much easier to bake bread. And this brings me to number four, uh, your sourdough starter is too acidic. The acid is what gives the sourdough this amazing taste. However, the acid is also our biggest enemy when it comes to over-fermentation. An over-fermented dough is likely going to turn out very flat inside of the oven and when you try to handle it, it becomes overly sticky. Well, chances are you run into over-fermentation and the reason for that is the acid inside of your sourdough starter. Your yeast also doesn't love the acidic environment. The yeast is more active when there's not so much acid inside of your sourdough. And the yeast is responsible for inflating our dough. So yes, acid is awesome, but we have to control it. And for this, I would always recommend you to adjust your feeding ratio. The feeding ratio is how much of pre-fermented flour are you mixing with new flour and new water. Now with a one to one to one ratio, you already have added quite a lot of pre-fermented flour to the mix. This means that you will in the end, when you mix your starter into your bread, have more acid inside of your bread. With a one to one to one ratio, you have more pre-fermented flour in the mix. And that means that you have a slightly more active starter, but at the same time, you also have more acid inside of your starter. When you mix that sourdough starter into your final dough, you will be starting on a higher level of acid in comparison to if you had used the different feeding ratio. Now, what I like to do is I like to feed my sourdough starter with a one to five to five ratio. That would be 10 grams of sourdough starter, 50 grams of water and 50 grams of flour. When I want to bake a bread the next morning, I like to do that overnight. So before going to bed, I feed a one to five to five ratio. Then in the morning after waking up, and yes, we Germans wake up very early, then your sourdough. Wait, maybe I'm not a real German. <laughs> So anyways, so in the morning, uh, then your sourdough starter is ready to be added to your main dough. What you could in fact do is you could auto lease already mix flour and water for your dough overnight as well. And then just put everything together in the morning. So yeah, try playing with your feeding ratio. I think it's definitely going to make a big difference. This brings you to number fünf, uh, number number five. <laughs> Okay, this was a strange mix. And yes, number five is you are not building enough dough. You are not building enough dough strings. And number five, you are not building enough dough strength. I'm sorry for my German TH. Now, dough strength. Dough strength is when you develop the gluten inside of your dough. By mixing, you are creating a strong gluten network inside of your dough. Now that's the basis in the end, if your dough holds together for getting that oven spring. If your dough doesn't hold together, it will just likely stay very flat. And if you want oven spring, then you have to develop dough strength. Now, if you're baking a bread that is not a wheat-based bread, let's say a rye bread, then don't worry about building any dough strength at all. And this is something I see many bakers not doing. They're not building enough dough strength. And to build those strength, I created a video that shows you exactly what to do. I'll be linking it right here. Too long didn't watch, pretty much. You have to auto lease, then you have to add your starter, then you have to do a little bit of bench kneading, and ideally, sometimes also lamination. If this doesn't make any sense for you, all the strange words I just said, then have a look at the video that I just linked. Now that you added your sourdough starter and you build all that strength, the bulk fermentation process starts. And there are so many things that can go wrong during your bulk fermentation process. I've been struggling so much myself with it. However, since this video is already so long, I'll take the other pitfalls and put them into another video. 
And as this series is still in the making, I would be very curious to know what would be some of the top tips you would recommend a new sourdough baker to follow. What piece of knowledge has made you a better sourdough baker? Please let the others know and drop a comment in the comment section. I hope you enjoyed this video and you learned something new. May the gluten be with you and see you again soon.